Yeah, I think I'll probably start. So it can I don't know if this is something else going to be. Good. Hi. Uh, right, um, first of all, apologies to anyone who thinks they're here uh, looking at how logs are used for um, debugging. <laughs> because this isn't that. Because uh, I was going to go to that one as well. <laughs> um, <coughs> yeah, no, this isn't that. This is basically um, I'm, I'm a stand in, a substitute, poor substitute for the guy who's going to be here. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, a custom Drupal 8 migration. Um, there is another migration talk tomorrow, which actually I'm going to go to. So, so but if you see me in there, please don't slag me off and say that his one is much better than mine, because I'm sure it probably is. Okay, so um, a bit about me first of all. Um, my name is Gary Figger, I'm a Drupal developer, I work at a company called Tez Global. Uh, they do uh, Times Education Supplement, uh, so if anyone knows it, uh, they do education services all around the world. Uh, I've been there about two and a half years, I've been in Drupal for about five years, five or six years, um, and I've recently started working with Drupal 8. So this is very much, when I say recently, in the last four or five months, so this is very much not an expert version of uh, Migrate, which is probably a good thing because an expert wouldn't have made all the mistakes that I've made that I'm going to tell you about, hopefully. Um, so and if you don't know Tez, and apologies, this was all a bit last minute, so I couldn't get, I tried to get converted to slides last night using React.js and it was a complete balls up, so I gave up. Uh, so it's on GitHub, and I'm going to send the link, give you the link later on. Um, so Tez, education site, uh, 8 million registered users. Um, they sell education resources around the world. If you want to find out more about them, go on the tez.com site or the about us. Sorry, site. could you please let us zoom in? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I'm trying to get through this blurby bit at the front very really quickly. <laughs> Can everyone see that okay? Yeah, yeah? cool. Um, so what's this presentation about? Now we're getting on to the interesting bit, all the background's done. Um, so it's basically, we're going to talk about the migration strategy that we've implemented at TES. Uh, we're going to look at some of different migration sources. We're going to look at some example code, uh, talk about some of the issues that I've had. And I'm hopefully, fingers crossed, I'm going to do a live demo of my great work with the custom migrations that I've written working, <coughs> not working as the case may be. Um, uh, so hopefully that will work. Uh, you probably heard people talking about migration in terms of uh, extract, transform and load. And that corresponds with the sort of three different phases of uh, migration. So when you look at the configuration file you'll see source, process and destination. And they all actually relate to the three different phases. And when they're talking about extract, they're talking about source, when they're talking about uh, transform, they're talking about process, when they're talking about load, they're talking about the destination functionality. So when you look at the config files, that's what those bits actually mean. And we're going to have a look at some of those uh, through this presentation. Stop me if I'm going too fast. I'm a little bit nervous. It's my first presentation, so it's going to be a little bit flaky. Uh, but please slow me down if I'm going too fast. And stop me if you've got any questions or anything along the way. Okay, so to get the migration working, a few modules that we use to start off with. So we'll, we obviously need Migrate, which is in core. Uh, migrate Plus, uh, which is a contrib module. And Migrate Tools, which is a contrib module. Um, migrate Plus got really good uh, migrate examples module in there. It's, uh, I don't know if, has anyone looked at the Migrate Plus module at all? Yes? No? There's a good example in there called the beer migration. So if you like beer, have a look at it. Um, it gives some good um, examples of uh, writing some of your own uh, source and process plugins. 
It also talks about the creation and demonstrates quite well the creation of stub entries, which we'll cover as I'm going through the presentation. That's a really good one to look at. Um, the migration we're looking at is going to be an SQL migration, although I did do uh, a CSV migration as part of this process, and I will touch on that as well. The only reason I'm saying that is because um, the SQL base uh, class is the one we're using um, for uh, database to database migrations, and that's actually in core. But if you want to do a CSV migration, then you'll need to use the contrib module, uh, which I'm going to mention as we go along, uh, and that's migrate source CSV. Um, my great tools is <coughs> the, like Drush goodies for doing migrations, so you'll need to install that. It also implements the UI for migrations, which we'll have a look at uh, as I do the presentation. Um, so a bit of background to the migration. We've got a current uh, D7 site. There's around about 250,000 nodes. Um, of which 215,000 uh, are news articles. So that we're doing a partial migration here. We're just migrating our news articles. We've got around about 16,000 authors of news articles and around about 55,000 managed files that relate to those news articles. Um, the business was proposing a redesign of the news part of the site and that gave us impetus to actually push for a Drupal 8 migration. Because there wasn't a return on investment, you know, the business didn't see any, any value in us migrating. Um, but obviously we had this big bit of work, so then we can push for D8 on the back of it. And um, this is still a work in progress, so we're actually only part way through this migration. Um, that code hasn't been run live yet, so that's why it might not work on a share team. It wouldn't work. Um, so the first phase of, uh, let's push that down a bit, so before you actually start typing away, developing your migration plugins, you know, or designing your content types or any of that kind of stuff, you really want to look at your existing data. You want to make decisions on whether your existing data is actually worth migrating. So um, and I've put down there automated versus manual migration. I mean, some bits of the data you might want to, there might even be a small, let's say you've got galleries or something, and you've only got a few galleries, it might be worth doing a manual exercise for those, rather than automating that uh, migration process. The reason I say that is that the manual migration has the benefit that the end users who are going to be editing the content get familiarity with the CMS and the new Drupal 8 editing functionality as part of that manual migration. The other thing to think about is, users will often say, I want all the content, but if you look at the content and then say to them, well actually there's not that much of that, if you want it, you enter it yourself, they might then actually reconsider whether that's actually worth taking over. So that's one of the things to think about. The other thing as well is that um, the, the data analysis that we do, excuse me, moving up, data analysis that we do drives the migration strategy so it drives our, our content types that we're going to build, but it also might drive our migration strategy. So that's another thing to think about. Um, I've also mentioned here about getting feedback from existing users. And the reason I mentioned this is that we had some ambiguous uh, uh, fields on our node, on our news article node, and the end users didn't actually know which of the fields to use. <coughs> so when you actually talk to the users and say, you know, are there any issues with the you editing content? They might feed back to you, and that also might drive your um, target content types. <coughs> um, this is the bit where I talk about our test CSV migration. So I did, the first issue we had was we had a load of themers. They wanted to design the, the, the front end stuff, but the site didn't have any content, so we needed to get some test content on there. So we did a source CSV migration to start off with, with just like 100 news articles. Um, so I'm not really going to touch on that very much, but um, I've put all the code up on the repo so you can pull the code down, have a look at it, and have a look at some of the plugins and all that sort of stuff. So source content that we wanted to migrate, so that's not too high for everyone, is it? You can see that, can I? 
Um, we had some different vocabularies we want to pull in. We had um, uh, some author notes, so the people who are writing news articles. News articles themselves, a load of managed and unmanaged files. We also had embedded content within our, um, within our news articles, so where they'd actually added um, uh, media files and stuff like that, we wanted to pull those out as well. Um, and we also had some uh, news images. We had two main images on our news articles, a hero image and a teaser image. And the end users never knew what the difference was between the two. So we've actually simplified that to actually have one image uh, on our news articles. Um, this was kind of the source data type. And I'm going to show you, hopefully, OK. Hopefully you can see that. So that's our uh, <coughs> source news article content type. There's quite a lot of fields on it, um, and some of the um, there was some ambiguity about some of the fields. So they had, for example, um, a teaser image. They never knew the difference between news article images and teaser images. We'd actually allowed as well them to have multiple images, but we'd only actually themed for one image. So that was a bit of a bug. Um, so they were adding multiple images, and were a bit confused why they weren't, weren't seeing a teaser image. Um, so we looked at this content, and what we ended up with was a simpler uh, content design, which hopefully will load very shortly. If not, I'll go back to the slide. OK, so we ended up moving from that, or, or in the process of moving from that, to this content type. So a much simpler content type. Okay, so that was all that was all fed from our um, data analysis phase. Plus we also had some because of the design constraints that we were given by uh, our UX department. We also had some additional fields that we were introducing uh, to meet those requirements. One of which, I don't know if you can see, uh, can you see up there we've got uh, our mobile title. What they wanted to do was they wanted to actually have a different uh, article title for mobile. So that was one of the design decisions that was come fed in from our um, design department. Um, so we're doing a database to database migration. So what we've got to do is we've got to define where our source data is coming from. Um, and the simplest way to do that, or the way to do that, is to set up a, um, an entry in your settings file. We're using the settings.local.php file. I don't know if anyone is using that for your local database connections and stuff. So I basically <coughs> set up a, a migrate database put the connection criteria in. Now unfortunately, this is one of the gotchas. My grade is the default name, the default database name for all migrations. And because of that, when you actually enable the migrate module, it creates loads and loads of migrate tables. Because what it does, it goes to that data, it says, is there a database called migrate defined? Oh yes, there is. Let's go away to that database, look at all the entities that are there, and create mappings for those on your source, on your target database. So you end up with shed loads of migrate tables. So this was one of the gotchas. That was the wrong choice of name. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll show you that in a minute. But you end up with loads of tables that you don't need. So I wouldn't specify your migrate database as migrate, call it something else. And then in your um, configuration, you simply point your configuration to that source database. <clears throat> so obviously, as I said, don't really want to call it um, migrate, call it something else. Now here what I'm going to do is I'm going to just switch to my code view bit. Uh, so let's just pull this up. Yeah, 
go. Okay, so in our code view bit, we're going to talk about some of our config files. So basically, so this is our configuration module. Oh, sorry, our um, news migration module. Now again, it doesn't have to be, you know, it's the wrong choice of name. It's because we already had done a CSV migration, which has been called news migration. So because I was then doing a live one, it was called news migration 2. Um, created this uh, migration bit module. Created a load of config. Now, one of the things uh, that um, uh, the, uh, the migrate tools and the other country modules for migrate do. They give you the ability to group migrations together. And one of the benefits of grouping migrations together is that you can define uh, shared configuration. So this is um, so for this migration I called the group news2. Should have really been called news, but never mind. Um, and I've added this shared configuration section. So in the shared configuration section, you can actually add, define anything you want your migrations that are in this group to actually use. Now, I was doing, using some <coughs> custom plugins to get my source data. And because I'm doing testing, what I wanted to do was I wanted to define a range of nodes that I was going to pick up. Because we've got 215,000 nodes, and I didn't want to run that migration on my tests to, to wait to see that it hadn't worked because I'd still be there now doing it. Um, so I added a, a, some selection that was then, would then be shared between all the other configurations that were within that group. Um, I specified there, um, this, this is another bit of custom configuration, and you'll see this when we look at the plugin. We're populating um, a taxonomy, the tax, tax, tax vocabulary, but we've already pre-populated some other vocabularies what we're doing is we're going to be using on our on our taxonomy field on our news article, we're going to be mapping multiple taxonomies to that field. So if it's all, if a term already exists in one of these other taxonomies, other vocabularies, we don't want to actually load it. So I've added this cross-reference um, list there, and what it does is when it's migrating taxonomy terms, it looks in those um, vocabularies to see if that term name already exists, and if it does it doesn't actually migrate it. But then when it comes to actually load it, it, you, it also pulls that name, corresponding term ID, from those taxonomy terms when it comes to actually load it on related entities. But I'll, I'll show you all of that. Again, this is all in shared configuration, so nice and easy, one place to do it. Um, I also want to specify uh, what my source domain is. Uh, I want to specify as a default um, what my uh, source uh, public folder is. Again, used in the uh, custom uh, plugins I've written, and where the default target folder is going to be. Um, all of this is shared, and this last bit here is another shared bit of config. What I want to do is I want to before they actually run the taxonomy uh, migration. I want them to make sure that those vocabularies have already been populated. So I'm passing that through into my plugin so that you can, in, its, in a check requirements phase of, of the actual migration, you can actually check those vocabularies and make sure that they've got terms in them. If they haven't, it won't run the migration. Does that all kind of make sense? Yeah? And then this last bit of constants. So, <coughs> All under the source bit, you can actually define constants that you want to then also use in other parts of the migration. So one of the things that I was doing was, we're not migrating users at the moment, so we're actually marking up all of our um, users against our entities that we're creating as being the admin user. So in here, I'm going to be just defining a user that I want to actually pass through as a user ID on those nodes. Ultimately, I might want to actually pick up users and migrate them as well, and then the actual, I wouldn't be using that constant. Uh, we've got defaults for our process. 
So we're defining a default value for the language. And then we've also got an enforced dependency. Now, what that means is, if, sorry, let me actually rephrase. When I actually, one of the gotchas I had, which I'm going to talk about later, was that I wrote the module, I installed it, set up all my config, and that's fantastic. And then I uninstalled the module and tried to reinstall it, all the and it fell over. And that's because the config existed in my um, in my database in the config table, and it tried to create that config again, and it fell over when it was trying to reinstall it. Now, if you put this dependency on each of your configurations in your migration, then when you uninstall the module, it will delete that config from the configuration table. If you don't, you have to do a hook and install in your install file to manually delete them. So that's a bit of a gotcha. <coughs> Pulling my hair out with that to start off with. So you'll see that in each of the configuration files on each of the migrations. So news groups, group, the ability to group migration is really useful. Um, And we'll look at some of the other migration stuff in a minute. So I'm going <coughs> to just delve, deep in, delve into code and all that sort of thing, if everyone's OK with that. And in the meantime, I will sort of enable the module as well. So we've got, I'll go to one of the easy ones. So tags. Tags are nice and easy because we're basically uh, migrating just the name um, and description. <coughs> so. Here we're using a custom plugin, custom source plugin. All of our database uh, related migrations have their own source plugins. And the reason for that is because you need to tell um, the, uh, the configuration where to get the data from. So you'll see a, a, a plugin for each of these, um, these sources. And they live underneath the uh, plugin folder right down in the tree, right underneath source, and you'll see it down here. So that's the plugin ID. And when you define the plugin class can be called whatever you like. The bit that actually maps it is this migrate source bit. So that's where you're defining the ID for that migration. Um, if you see errors in my code, please don't shout it out. Just to, um, message me afterwards. Um, so this is where the tags bit is being done. So if we go back to the actual tags migration file, configuration file, nice simple mapping, we're mapping the name and the description. Um, we're using uh, the vocabulary that we want to map to, we're using this, post, this core plugin uh, default value and we're giving it the value of tags. So we're just actually, default value enables you to put a default value against the field. Um, there's a whole load of uh, core process plugins. And there's a good page, I've included some links in the presentation, a good page that lists all those core process plugins. But you can easily write your own. Um, so that's uh, not a problem. I'm just going to move this to one of at the moment, so we're there. So we're pulling in, as part of this migration, we're pulling in three, uh, we're pulling in, um, we've got some pre-populated vocabularies, which are regions, phases, and subjects. We're pulling in three different taxonomy fields, because on our, on our old news article, we had three taxonomy fields, and we're mapping those to a single taxonomy field on our new content type. Um, so these are the three fields. Now, if the name from the taxonomy exists in any of those pre-populated vocabularies, which are these, then we don't want to migrate it, we want to use the term ID that's in that. And we have a migration requirement that those vocabularies, these ones, have been pre-populated. <coughs> so switching back to the code. <coughs> so what you'll see in these uh, database to database migrations, or at least the ones that I'm showing you. Much of the transform logic is being done in the source plugin. 
So in the prepare row bit, you can do all the stuff that you might do in your transformation in the process part, you can actually do it in there. And I just find that a little bit easier. But you know, you can write process programs as well if you prefer. And I'll show you examples of both of those. But when we look through some of this code, you'll see that most of the logic is done in the source. So this, as I say, is the, uh, the tags one. We're extending the core um, SQL base class. Um, we've got a check requirements function. So in here, what we're doing is we're actually, um, if I, this bit here was just because what I wanted to do was make sure that the source database existed and it, and it had tables that were populated because I had a script that I was doing to build my local environment and I had a bug in that script and I was dropping my source database and recreating an empty database. So my tables didn't exist and I was scratching my head and I thought I'll just put this in there. Shouldn't need to do this really. But all this does is actually checks that the source database exists. You know, the tables that I'm expecting exist. Um, this bit here is looking at the configuration and it's looking for required vocabulary IDs. So remember we defined that in our um, shared configuration in the groups. So if that exists and what it's doing is passing those vocabulary IDs over to this um, check ref data populated and all that's doing is going through those vocabularies and making sure that it's, that it's got terms and if it hasn't it returns false and we throw a requirements exception. So what it will actually do, if you're running it from the UI, when you run it, um, actually let's run it from the UI and you can see what it does. So this is an empty database. I haven't even enabled the module yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into um, Drush. Enable the module. Refresh my screen. So this UI that we're seeing here is what the Migrate Tools uh, contrib module provides you with. And I was using this for most of my testing. Um, obviously if you're doing it live, you get much more uh, flexibility through the Drush commands. But obviously for the testing I'm doing, it was, it was absolutely fine. Um, so I'll do my list migration. So those are all the migrations that are defined in the group news team. Um, when you look at it in Drush, I'm going to, sh I'm going to show you on, on the Drush side as well. When you run, the, run it on Drush, again. Okay, when you run it on Drush, it's, it's doing more or less the same thing as Drush. The difference is, is that the Drush version takes account of any dependencies that you've defined in your migrations. And when I say dependencies, let's say for argument's sake you're running, you're loading a news article, but that news article you're actually populating fields with entities that you create in other parts of the migration, like taxonomy terms, like image files, file entities, <coughs> um, authors. So your, your news migration is then dependent on those other migrations having been run. And what Drush does is it will order these, it will work out based on those uh, dependencies which order these migrations should be running and will then show you those migrations. Now, I don't know if you can see, we were just looking at the tags migration, weren't we, just now. Can you see that's not actually there? And the reason that's not there is because I haven't run the pre-population um, for that part of the migration. So the, it's failed the check requirements, so it's not actually showing. So we, I'm ju just going to pop back to here. And we have um, we 
we have some other migrations that were driven by somebody else uh, that are populated in this, what we're calling ref data. And I don't know if you can see, so the, in the composer file, the composer JSON file, they've defined a script to run those files. It's quite a nice little way of actually wrapping up scripts like that, because then you can actually run them as a, as a script. And I'll show you how that looks. I mean, it is shown in, in, in the presentation documents, but if I just show you how that looks. Okay, can you see, um, what's up there? can you see that file there? So that's the composer JSON file, and this is the script section. So you can actually define the different scripts that you want to run. And so when I did that import ref data, it was running uh, CD to web, and then all of that, all of those drush commands. So just a little technique, whether it's useful to you or not, I just found it useful. Um, so, can you see that's running, and it's, and it's populating a load of taxonomy terms. And when it finishes, what should happen, <coughs> and it's populating all of these taxonomies down here, what, is, what should happen when it finishes? I'll go back to the thing. Okay. So if I now was to run my group, whoops, and obviously I need to be in my web folder, I should see, can you see I've now got my tag migration at the top, which I didn't have before because it failed the check requirement. So, so it's actually clever in that way. It won't let you run things if they fail the migration. The UI will let you run the stuff. It just won't do anything. Um, it runs and says no, no nodes loaded. And you'll actually then need to go to the DB log to actually see the, the requirements error uh, message. Cool. So what I can do now is go to my migrations. And this one I'm going to run from the uh, UI. So I'm going to run the tag migration. So 284 nodes. Uh, and if we look at the uh, we look at the code. So the code, that 284 is being pulled back by the query method. So it's running this query and it's getting back. Uh, the total number of rows in it, so it knows there's 284 rows that it's going to migrate, or it thinks it's going to migrate, because you can actually stop it from migrating stuff in the prepare row by returning false. So I'm going to try to execute that. And before I do that, I'll just show you the prepare row there. So in my prepare row there, there, what I've actually got is this bit here. So what this bit is doing is it's going away and it's looking for that name uh, in uh, a load of vocabularies. And if it exists, it will return false. So the idea is, is that it won't actually migrate that road. So although it says 284, I'm expecting it to actually migrate less. So I'll click on the execute thing. I'll go to the uh, execution page uh, and I don't need to tick any of these because I, this is the first time I'm running it. If I'd run it before I would probably want to tick that because I might want to update some stuff. So I'm going to click on execute. That will fire off a, a um, batch run. And as you can see it's going through and it's doing something. Off, it's doing something. So while that's running, if I switch back to my uh, tags file, so we've talked about the source bit and we've kind of talked about the process bit because that's where our mapping is being done. What is actually the target entity that we're creating is a taxonomy term. So we're using the uh, the entity plugin, entity taxonomy term plugin. 
So the stuff that comes out of our process bit is going to be chucked into that class to actually do our, do our load. So switching back to the browser, 64% through. So what we should see in a minute is whether it's actually worked or not. It always seems faster through Drush as well, that's the other thing. So, and it probably is faster <coughs> through Drush. Okay, so with, that's been finished now. So actually, it's created 245. Uh, taxonomy terms because this other 39 already existed and we can prove that by looking at the uh, we can't prove they already exist but we can look at our um, our tags vocabulary so this is what we've just populated okay so we've done the first part of that migration And you can see when you look at the migration UI, we've now got a last imported date. Um, as well as that, we also get entries in our migration tables. So what actually happens is, uh, I'm in the right place. So this is where I was telling you about all these loads of migration map tables. Can you see that? Shed loads of them. So don't call your database name migrate call it something else. Um, so if we look at our tags migration map, so what it'll actually do is this contains a, a mapping from our source ID to our target ID. So when we do our other related migrations, we can say, we can point to that migration and say, use the cross-reference in here to get the target ID. And you'll see that for, for all of the different migrations. So our tags are migrated now. And switching back to here. If we were to run that now, we again we see the same thing that we saw um, through the UI. So the next bit we want to do, looking at this list here, we want to actually uh, pull in some uh, file entities. Probably going to run out of time actually, so I will try and speed up a bit. So on the file entity ones, <coughs> go to the right place. Oops. <coughs> oh, have the ones over here. Too many screens open. So if we go to our file entities. Uh, which are articles, author images, we're going to do. So author images, what we're going to do here is we're going to, um, we're using another source plugin, this time called uh, D7NewsFile. And if we look down here, this is our class that we've written for that. We've extended the, um, we've extended the uh, file class. And I've just given it an alias there, just like that. We've got some other requirements in here. So as well as checking that the target database, the source database is <coughs> listed, I'm also making sure that we've got, we've specified folders for the migration. So we've specified a source domain, we've got a, a public folder, we've got a target folder, all that configuration exists. Some of this down. Um, we're also using uh, some source SQL, and the reason we're doing that is because we've got lots of files that we're going to migrate. I just decided I was going to write a utility where I could pass through the names of the, the fields, and it would actually then do the appropriate joins to the managed files table. So instead of writing an individual a bit of querying logic for each of the different file types. We just actually specify the source tables in here, and then my um, uh, source plugin would actually do the magic for me. 
which it would do down here, if you can see that. So it builds the joins and all that sort of stuff. Um, I've added a additional, we're actually extending the file uh, class, which has its own set of fields. But I'm also adding some additional, an additional dummy field to it, or custom field, which is this destination path. And the reason I do that is because from my source plugin, I'm saying to the migration where I want the file to be saved. And I'm building that destination path in my prepare row. Does that all make sense? Yes, no? Yeah. Yeah. So in my prepare row, I'm going away and pulling in a load of stuff. And you can probably see down here. So one of the things I'm doing is I'm taking my source file name and I'm trying to nicify it. So I'm trying to, where it's got embedded spaces or you know, mixed case or stuff like that, I'm trying to make it into a nicer format name. Um, what I'm then doing is I'm going to be building up, you can see it down here, this destination file path. So from the folders that I've passed in in configuration, I'm going to build up the name of where I want it to be saved. If that will make sense. And then I basically just have to set that property back on the source row. So then that property becomes available, that amended property becomes available in my process uh, part of the um, migration. And you'll notice that in my process part of the migration, if we look at our, oh, it help, I was looking at the right migration. Too many screens open, let me shut. This one down. Go into this one. So if we look at the images bit, if we look at our process part, there I'm using the file destination that I've just built to point to where I want the destination of the file to go. So as you can see, what I'm doing is I'm trying to do most of my logic in the source plugins. I could have done this in the process ones as well if I wanted to, but I just find it easier to do it in the source ones. So I'm going to just run that migration. So that is this news authors images, if I can find it. My eyes are terrible. Now going back to here, what we've got is we want a target folder of author images. So looking at my site, Oops, looking at my site. Okay, so I've got no real folders in there. So what I want to do is I'm going to create, this migration should create that destination folder, which is author images, and should populate it with the author images for the file migration. So I'm going to run this. And fingers crossed it will work. Okay. So two parts of this. One part is go away, pull, use the um, download mechanism to get the file, uh, create the folder that it's going to go to, save it in that folder, create a file entity. And if I look back at my Sites folder. I'm hoping I'm going to see my author images, which I am. And if I go back to my database, what I should see. Okay, so let's have a look. So 18 files, 18 migrated. What I should see. These my file entities created on my target database. Um, I'm probably this ends this ends, this ends at ten two, does it? Yeah. I'm pretty much near the end actually. I'm so, sorry about that. I'm just going to mm -hmm. quickly show you one process plugin to just give you an idea. Of two process plugins, and then um, if you've got any questions, can, can you just remove the CD one? Oh yeah, sorry. Okay. Where, where did I put that? Uh, oh, yeah. That's because <laughs> I was, yeah. So this is where um, 
This is where having stuff in Git is great because you can just uh, invert it. That's the trouble with having too many screens open as well. I don't know if you found that, typing in the wrong little window sometimes. Okay, so um, just going to have a quick look at a couple of process plugins. So the first one I'm going to look at is this D7 stop name. Um, has anyone heard of the concept of, or anyone aware of the concept of stubbing, creating stubs for things in migrations, yeah? yeah. So what you'll see in most of the migration stuff, and I will share <coughs> this um, URL with everyone. In fact, you can actually just take a note of it. So this URL here, that contains all of the, uh, that contains all of the source code that I've shown you as well as all these slides and a presentation and another, another big readme file with gotchas and examples of things that went wrong for me. So you can pull that down. I think that they're going to um, actually publish the links to all this sort of stuff at some stage. I don't know when. Um, but you'll see that most of the migrations that I've got, I've specified no stub of, of, uh, of uh, true, which basically means I don't want you to create a stub entry for these. And the reason is, is I'm going to do the migration in the sequence that it's intended to be, so that when I get to a point where I'm doing a migration, I shouldn't need to, that entity should exist. The only, diff, the only one that's the exception to that is the news articles, because they reference themselves, because they've got a related content entity. So you do need to create a stub for those. And so you'll, when you look at the migration, you, you'll see that the, the no stub for that is commented out, it defaults to false. Um, and when you create if I look on here, when it creates stub entities, can you see some of these lovely names? Can you see that? Really rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? That's the sort of naming convention that it does when it creates a stub entity. So what I've done, but I only did it this morning, uh, I have actually changed that. I've written a, uh, a little uh, process plugin called um, stub name and what I've done with that one if I just open up my recent so what I've done and the reason I didn't do it on my uh, proper migration stuff is because I didn't want it to break it I don't know if you can see that all right, but what I'm doing here in my title, I'm using my D7 stub name plugin uh, with a source of title. So the source for that plugin or source value is the title field, and I'm prefixing.